obviously one of the most important issues in our day is the issue of religious liberty. And thinking in particular about pastors and Tim and I as pastors, what we really want to know about this issue of religious liberty is what does Russ Moore have to say about it? So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll start with you. Because <clears throat> you're thinking about this and you're in this. What do pastors have to understand about this crisis of religious liberty that we're facing? Well, I think the first thing is just being able to explain what it means to be motivated by the gospel. I mean, uh, the, the primary problem, I think, right now for religious liberty is not that you have people who are plotting to destroy uh, religion. I mean, there are some people who, of course, are doing that. But I think most of the problems come with people who just don't get religious motivation. Uh, the, and so they assume if we apply pressure, cultural pressure or political pressure or legal pressure will get you where you're going to be anyway, which is in a more, a more secular yeah. progressive direction. And so I think part of it is just explaining to your secular neighbors what it means to be motivated by the fear of the Lord, what it, what it means to be people who really do believe that you're going to give an account uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. And so equipping your people to be able to have those conversations, I think that's actually more important uh, than even the important legal and, and political and other questions that we have to And, and have either of you found that effective? I mean, in talking to very secular people, I mean, and I ask the question, I guess, somewhat suspiciously thinking about some of the folks I know who, who might listen sort of kindly, but, but then turn around and say, well, I, I still think you don't have a, a right to be motivated in those ways. I mean, how, how have, you, have you found that to get traction with people? Yeah, I, I have. Okay. Uh, because because what some people assume is that religious people must really have some other motivation. Yeah, that's they true. They must really be about saving money or about some sort of political power. And so coming in and explaining and saying, no, pe people really do believe uh, these things. And, and I found that uh, it's also important if we're the ones standing up for people who do not believe the things that we believe in. I mean, religious liberty is not special pleading for whoever has, uh, whoever has some real or imagined majority. And so pastors need to be the ones who are standing up and saying to their own people, and it takes some cost to do this, uh, depending on where you are. The mosque that is being constructed on the other side of our town needs to have no impediments from the government uh, in terms of their construction. And, and to teach your people, we don't need government power to defend the gospel. The gospel can stand up for itself. Yeah. So Tim, w w when you try to have these conversations with, with non-Christians, explain your views, d do they come around to thinking that you're not a bigot? Well, what, what, what Russ just said was, does resonate because um, Sometimes, some not, not. I, I think the conversations are usually more di somewhat disarming because you, you are uh, getting rid of stereotypes. And I actually, the reason I realize, what resonates is, I've realized lately, in the last two years, I've gotten to, I've talked to some, most of these, I won't mention their names, so you'd know most of them are, you might say, um, Christian jur uh, jurists, Christian law professors and all that, who have shown me, at first it kind of panicked me, that actually religious liberty, there's not a lot of actual hard in the Constitution law. Re religious liberty has largely been a cultural um, uh, mood that most people thought, of course you have to give people you know, uh, freedom for their religious conscience. It's just, there's not lots and lots of really great laws for it. It was, it was, it was really the, the will of the society. And now that you, now you do have these polls showing that like 60, 70 percent of people say, no, you shouldn't have the right to say this or that. that. unless we actually just get out there and talk to people, it really is to a great degree a matter of public opinion, popular opinion. Um, and I don't, I think a lot of the Christians who are being publicized very often don't speak very well for us. And I, I hate to say that, that's a little bit part of the, of the strategy, is to highlight them. Because the, the ordinary reasonable Christian who simply says, well, you know, actually, I don't choose this belief. I can't help it. This is a belief I've got, and it creates a problem. But when I talk to people, I usually talk about conscientious objecting. My father was a pacifist in World War II, lost all of his friends, all of his friends. World War II, yeah. you know, not Vietnam. And, um, uh, and I often say, uh, there's, there was a law, which was everybody had to serve, 
and, and yet the government defended some people's right to not fight when really our lives were at stake. I mean, they would have come and taken us over. Mm -hmm. You know, haven't you seen the man in the high castle? Well, not anybody, that sort of thing. They would have taken us over. So here's my father who said, I've got a religious objection and uh, this is a law that I can't obey. And every, even though, I mean, even though people were extremely unhappy with conscience objectors, nobody said, let's get rid of it. It was just understood. So I usually ask people about that. I, people who say, you don't have the right because you're of your religious conscience not to obey the law. And I say, so what do you think about conscience objection? I mean, there's a law. There's a law that matters. You have to go fight for your country because otherwise they'll come take us over. I said, so are you f for getting rid of that? And they almost always say no. I said, why? And, and they say, well, because, and I said, well, then why, why would you not, be? the reason I got this is Pope Francis calls it conscientious objection. Whenever he talks about the Little Sisters mm -hmm. or any place where he's talking about uh, religious liberty, he calls it conscientious objection and ties it to, to that. And I usually find, if you're just looking for a strategy, I, I usually use it and then just talk reasonably. And I would say three times out of four, people come away being a lot more on our side than they were before. But one time out of four, they're just angry. I mean, it is important to, to show a, a sane, rational, yes. decent, friendly just Christian view. I, I mean, I live in, in a very liberal university city, and I'll talk to people who will who will get talking to me about things assuming that I must think the same way they do about transgender issues or about homosexuality because I seem like a normal person in a liberal town. And to try to voice another opinion takes some courage, but hopefully that puts some of that discontinuity. I, I wonder, Russ, how do you respond to this typical sort of objection? You know, you talk about religious liberty or freedom and somebody's going to say, well, what if my religion says that, you know, I, I don't have to give my kids an operation with their, when they're sick, or my religion says that I can you know, beat my wife. You get those mm -hmm. sort of sure. reductio ad yeah. absurdums. W what's your response to that sort of? Because that could apply to any right. You, you could do that with freedom of speech. You could do that with freedom of the press. Uh, you could do, every right that we have in society is always, is never absolute. Yeah. Uh, right. So the question is, is this a natural right? that we have to balance with, with other things. And sometimes you're gonna have easy cases, sometimes you're gonna have very difficult cases, uh, but we have to have some standard uh, where we're saying we, we have to balance these conflicting interests. So no one is suggesting in American life that, that we all get a little golden card that <laughs> right. says I, I have a religious objection and that means yeah, that I'm, I'm, completely, uh, I'm completely free. With conscientious objection, for instance, um, that has limits. Uh, and so uh, someone, uh, someone can say, I'm a conscientious objector, but that doesn't mean uh, that uh, everyone who wants to just dodge the draft is able to do it and say, well, I'm a religious person. No, we, we, we balance those things we, and we, we try to find a way to have people have sincerely held religious beliefs while also upholding things that we need to get And, and like with the, the Hobby Lobby case, you, you had to ask, does the government have a compelling interest in right. forcing someone to violate their conscience and are they doing it in the least obtrusive means possible. Right. That's right. Just, just to go that route, I think can help people think a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, 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 they're going to be hard cases, but does the government have a, a compelling interest to do this? And is there an easier, better way they right. can do it? Which is the Little Sisters of the Poor case. That's what, that's what it all came down to. Is, is not, the question wasn't, does the government have an interest in this? It's do they have to do this with nuns? Yeah. Uh, is this the, the only way that they, can, that they can deliver these drugs and devices? Yeah. And so that's the question. So, you know, last question, and we'll give it to you, Russ. You, you know, we talked about, and I love the way you started this by, you know, how do we talk to our neighbors? But, but give us just a little snapshot of, of the legal challenges. What are things pastors of churches should be aware of? Some of the things that, that may be coming down, some of the challenges we might face? I think most pastors that I talk to anyway are worried about the wrong things. Okay. Uh, mo many pastors are worried, is the government going to force me to do weddings that I don't believe in and so forth. And, and my answer to that is no. I mean, I, I don't think so, unless there's a military coup and a repeal of the Bill of Rights. I, I just don't think that's going to happen. I think that the questions are going to be, as you move out from the church yeah. with institutions, uh, adoption agencies and, and colleges and universities, that's where you're going to have uh, religious liberty problems that are going to increase. And then, uh, we also have to always be watching for those religious liberty violations with groups that we don't agree with yeah. at all. I mean, uh, Islam, 
Uh, I, I fundamentally disagree uh, with Islam, but there is, there is a constant uh, series of ways of demonizing uh, Muslims and seeking to actually legislate them out of existence. I don't want to legislate my mission field out of existence. Uh, I, I want to be able to, to have conversations with people where my Muslim neighbor can seek to persuade me that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet, and I can seek to persuade her that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. We don't need government power to do that. And so we need to be watching for whenever you see this sort of foment that is coming against people because of their religious convictions, because what happens is uh, you, you always just end up sending those people uh, under cover of darkness. You don't turn them into Christians. You, at, at best, you turn them into pretend Christians. At worst, you, 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 yeah. you harden them, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I know I speak for Tim to say, Thank you for Thank you. helping, equipping pastors doing this and, and being sort of that bridge between the people making some of these decisions and, and helping the churches understand it. So yeah. thank you, Russ. Yeah.